<coughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Garth Ratcliffe. Um, this presentation about <coughs> the Pretoria pit disaster is based on a booklet written by Pam Clark, um, former president of West Hartland Local History Group, and uh, she unfortunately died about a couple of years ago. Uh, in addition, there are some slides from a presentation by David Owen, a former mining engineer, who was a member of our, <coughs> our committee, and information from Alan Davis's authority to boot the Pretoria pit disaster. Um, we have on the front page also a painting by, a watercolour painting by Tom Newton of the, uh, <coughs> the scene at the pit head immediately after the explosion. Right. The Pretoria pit disaster was the worst in terms of <coughs> number of deaths in Lancashire and the third worst in British history. Um, that on the left is an image of the book that Pam Clark wrote. And I've got many of the facts that I'll be quoting you today from this book. Um, this was first published in uh, for the centenary of the Pretoria and we've had a reprint uh, last year. <clears throat> if anybody wishes to purchase this book, then uh, it, the, the, I think you could probably obtain a, a copy from the reception desk in the in the West Hartland Library, or if you contact us through this email address, hyphenhistory at gmail.com, we will sort that out. There is another uh, excellent book on the Pretoria Pit disaster, also written in 2010. <coughs> by Alan Davis, who is an absolute authority on coal mining in, in Lancashire. <coughs> um, Alan uh, does guided tours of the Pretoria site and his contact email is, uh, is listed there. Uh, that, that, that email will be shown again on the last slide, so you don't need to panic about copying it down. There is another important source of information that you should know about. In West Horton Library, there are two display cabinets full of Pretoria exhibits, and I shall refer to those later on. So this presentation has some structure to it, and we're trying to answer a number of basic questions. Where was the Pretoria pit located? What was the nature of the disaster? Why did the disaster occur? What was the impact on the local community of the disaster? And did any changes in mining practices arise? Did any good come from the event? Um, so I forgot to mention, there will be time for questions at the, at the end or additional points that you may wish to make. So Holton College number three and four, that is the Pretoria pit. And <clears throat> number three shaft is on the left here. Number four is on the right. And we see on the scene some uh, coal wagons with the Holton name on it. <clears throat> um, a more famous picture, uh, photo, famous because of the cracks in the glass at the front. Again, this shows number three and number four shaft and the Holton uh, coal wagons. And it shows a, a, a rail <coughs> connection over top for, to, to bring coal from the tubs up through the shaft and wheel them along here and empty them into the uh, wagons that can be taken away by um, the rail. <coughs> uh, the, some history about the, the actual pits. Uh, the shafts were sunk in 1900. The official name of the pit, Holton Colliery Bank, pits three and four. Uh, the popular name was Pretoria because the shafts were sunk at the same time as during the Andalus Boer War in South Africa, the British captured the, uh, the Pretoria city in 1900. <clears throat> the proprietors were the Holton Colliery Company and the general manager was Alfred Joseph Tong, a name that we, we shall uh, come across later on. <clears throat> uh, the full day shift had started to work at 6.30 a.m. in the morning 898 men and boys accessed the workings at various seam levels via both shafts. 
The men entering number four shafts were mostly to survive the explosion due to geological difference in the coal dust there and having separate ventilation systems. That will become a bit clearer later on. <clears throat> the disaster was caused by an explosion which occurred at 10 to 8 on Wednesday, 21st of December, 1910. And we know that for a fact because the watches of several victims stopped at that time. And the incident occurred about 300 yards below the surface at the level of the yard mile. I'll explain what the yard mile means in, in a minute or two. <clears throat> now, many of the uh, pictures that I'll be showing you, photographs, are of from newspapers, so the quality isn't great. So this is a typical uh, newspaper photo where you can see the back coming through. Uh, but it's, it's just a different view of the number three shaft, number four shaft, and the powerhouse. Uh, <coughs> In even in 1910, considerable electricity was used for various functions in the pit. Electricity was used uh, <coughs> to for lighting, surface extractor fan, fans, conveyor belts, ventilation fans, coal cutting tools, and haulage of coal tools. The lifts, cages in the shafts were powered by steam winding engines. They had to be powerful to raise the coal tubs to the to the surface. Um, there are quite a number of famous photographs associated with disaster and this is one of them. Uh, men, probably miners who, who weren't at work at the time, uh, waiting for news at, at the surface. <clears throat> the damage produced by the explosion, which would have been heard all over West Orton, some of the damage is shown there, some more damage here and yet more at the top. And again, men waiting for news. This bottom right hand corner uh, picture shows the winding gear for shaft number three has been damaged. So that, that was out of action completely. Uh, this is a very famous telegram from someone uh, telegramming the Earl of Ellesmere <coughs> in London informing them about the explosion. The Earl of Ellesmere owned the Bratley pit and all the land <coughs> south of, the, of, of Salford. Um, there has been an explosion this morning at the Holton Collins. I've just returned from there. All possible aid being rendered from here. Did not see Walwick, who was below, will wire again later. So presumably Walwick was one of the uh, managers on, on the ground. Now, the time of this telegram was 10.55, the same morning. <clears throat> now, this is quite a, an informative uh, sketch of the uh, location of Pretoria. We'll start with the location of Pretoria at the bottom here. Uh, that that horizontal line there is more or less the Atherton border. So that, that's uh, number three and four pits, Pretoria. Here we have Newbrook Road, St. Helens Road, uh, Holton Lane Ends, or four lane ends, the A6 running along here to Checkerbent. And uh, the Holton Estate owned all this land. And the initial attempts at mining were, were in this area here. And this was why the Bolton Lee Railway was built running from Bolton from this Pendlebury Fold that the the coal would be loaded onto the rail railway at that, at that point. And some of you may be aware of the Bolton Re Railway. Initially, it went over the level crossing in 1828, then in 1820, 1885, sorry, it went under the road to reduce the, the climb up here for the, the train. So the, the whole of the land slopes down from, from the a6. Uh, <clears throat> and as, as we know, when, we, when we've gone down Newbrook Road, it does slope down considerably. The levels off uh, at the bottom here. All right. So as I said, all, all this was the um, Holton Estate, and we know getting up to date, Peel Holdings have purchased this land and are planning to develop, uh, build housing there and a golf course somewhere on the on the rest of it. 
Uh, this is a more detailed map of the same area. So again, we've got St. Helens Road, Newbrook Road, uh, and <coughs> um, going down to Atherton. This, this, this here is the border with, with Atherton. And this is the, the railway that I've already referred to, showing uh, offshoots coming down to the to Holton Colliery number three and four. Now these black lines are interesting. They they are where the uh, seams or mines were being worked on in at the time of the explosion. And you might initially think, well, they're a long way from the actual um, <clears throat> shaft. And there will be, of course, tunnels reaching those. And as I've said previously, um, some of the workings actually went under Newbrook Road. So, Brenda, that might be a problem for you. It might <laughs> be under your house. <laughs> right. Um, so, some information about this map. So, this is a scale map, the 1909 Ordnance Survey map. I'm not going to go through all the, these details. But to, just to point out, this number nine is the North Plodder number one phase. That's where the explosion is uh, took to place. So uh, quite some distance from, from the other workings. Um, this is a more detailed uh, map of how the coal was transported away from the mine. That will be number three, shaft number four, so that the uh, tubs, coal and tubs will come up the shaft and be loaded into uh, wagons and taken away by the trains here. Any sort of non-coal materials, soil, dirt, uh, rock and stone will be taken further along and dumped at, at, at the end here. Um, <clears throat> so the rest of the uh, Holton Estate was was woodland and, and grass. It was the bottom end of the Holton Estate where this pit was located. In fact, there were five coal seams at uh, at the uh, uh, Holton Colliery, and uh, uh, and I'll, I'll show you some details of of these the depth of these. We can see the measure on this sort of sketch here. So we're going to be particularly interested in the plodder mine and the yard mine, about 300 yards below the surface. And we've also got information on here that the number three and number four shaft were only 50 yards apart. And I'll talk about that later on. So an idea of the depth of these uh, uh, mines was in comparison with the Eiffel Tower, the yard mine was about that deep. And the, the deepest mine it was about the same depth as the Empire State Building is, is high. <clears throat> now here we have a picture of miners at the entrance to, to one of the mines. We can see the uh, rails that the uh, coal tubs were, were uh, not pushed along, pulled along with the electric uh, power. Uh, and these miners are uh, quite surprising that they haven't got any safety helmets or safety boots on. I, I was under the impression, well, that chap looks we might have clogs on. I was under the impression that all miners wore, wore clogs. Uh, so there we are. Uh, again, this is quite an interesting uh, picture showing one gentleman testing for gas. And he's got safety boots on. Testing for gas there. Again, these men, they, they have no protective helmet, <coughs> helmets on. Now, the reason why he's testing for gas up there is because methane is less dense than other gases that could exist in the, in the mine, air, for example. Um, so the densities are, are, are shown here. The density of methane is the lowest point. So this compared with the density of water, which is a thousand kilograms per meter cube. So this methane would rise to the top of the, uh, of, of the mine, <coughs> of the tunnels, of the mine set. Um, ventilation was very, very important in, in the uh, mines. And this was uh, <coughs> necessary to remove poisonous gases, inflammable gases and dust. dust 
but it's very, very dangerous. That uh, could uh, produce a bigger explosion than the gas. So that the, the actual ventilation of the mine was uh, quite complicated. And I suspect, I don't know for, for certain, but the two shafts, number three and four, would be necessary to ensure a certain level of uh, movement of, of air. <clears throat> um, again, uh, these are quite detailed diagrams. And again, we had sort of cross um, air, air flow between different parts of the pit. But nevertheless, it's uh, a little bit difficult for me to understand how the ventilation could be could reach where the miners were actually working. <clears throat> Cause of the explosion, the official report into the disaster by Redmond in 1911 concluded that a damaged safety lamp ignited the gas methane pouring from an extensive roof fault. On the previous day, a roof fault about 20 yards long had occurred along the north face of the Plodder District Mine, and this had caused a large gas leak. At the inquiry, considerable debate ensured about the safety of miners' lamps. Uh, these two types of lamp were used, wolf safety lamp and previously a protector lamp. And this issue was discussed in great depth in Alan Davis's book. What we, we might consider at this point is, well, why is it that it was commonly known that roof falls were associated with the release of gas. If this gas had been produced the day before the explosion, why didn't somebody check up or test to see what was going on? Well, we'll never know the answer to that. However, uh, there is another view, namely that some of the cables which were used to pull the coal tubs and passing over metal pullers sometimes sparked and this could have ignited gas. Subsequently, a much larger explosion from the ignition of coal dust occurred. So it wasn't just the, uh, of course, you, you, you would only get a tremendous explosion from gas if it was under pressure, um, but that doesn't seem to be the case with, with dust. So we've all heard about uh, explosions in, in flour mills that flour exploding because of the high energy of the dust. Um, right, now, after the explosion, uh, which would, I say, would have been heard all over West Horton, people rushed to the top of to the um, uh, uh, shaft to see, for, for waiting for news. There were, there were no roads to the um, <coughs> shafts three and four, pits three and four, so it would be necessary for people to walk over the fields. And uh, here's another one of children, the children of the miners and the uh, mothers and wives, uh, women. And as a, you, you may have noticed that all of these uh, females, they didn't wear coats, they all wear, wore shawls, <coughs> whereas men wore jackets. So a lot, lots of people congregated at the top of the pit. The official total was 344 deaths, comprising 328 colliery employees, 16 contractors and the staff. And these figures include a fireman, William Turton, who went down the pit with the recovery men, but became separated from was overcome by fumes. Survivors. Well, uh, <coughs> Not, of course, not everybody, not, not all of the 800 and odd men who were down the pit at the time of the explosion were killed. 545 men were rescued from number four pit, but many of them were badly gassed rather than physically injured. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so that these two, uh, Jay Sharps and Parkin, were badly gassed. John Sharp was appearing on a postcard at the same time as one of the three Victoria survivors who died a week later. William Davenport and Joseph said were the only survivors in number three pit. And they are shown on this famous postcard, which is in the one of the cabinets upstairs in, in West Hall Library. Um, <coughs> now, uh, a, a number like 344 victims doesn't mean much, at least to me, 
But what does mean much more to me is, is a list of names and the ages of the victims. Look at these age 14, 15, 14, and what jobs they were doing and where they were born. And most of the people working in the pit came from West Orton, Atherton, Dobble, and the surrounding areas, but quite a number came from further afield. Preston, uh, I'm not suggesting they travelled daily. This is where they were born. So quite a number of people came from the from Cheshire and uh, Staffordshire. <coughs> and so that this list of names um, puts that number 344 in uh, perspective. <coughs> Uh, now, just to fill you in a little bit, uh, one of the reasons why I'm doing this presentation is that four of my relatives were killed in the disaster. Uh, Richard Mather, uh, age 49, he was born in Birkenhead, and he actually lived at 6 Mill Street, West Orton, where I lived till I was 23. And Daniel Mather is his uh, his son, <clears throat> uh, and in fact, Edward Mother was his, his brother. <clears throat> so if we go on to the next one, we can also look at some Ratliffs. Um, Thomas Ratliff and William Ratliff, they were my grandfather's brothers. They were both killed, uh, obviously, in uh, 1910. My father was born in 1911, and... He was named Thomas William after these two. Now, just today, I've received some information about Isaac Ratliff. I'm not related to him. These two weren't related to him. And it was from someone called Keith Ratliff, who lives in New Zealand. And he says that his father's eldest brother, Isaac Ratliff, he was in charge of North Plodder on the night shift prior to the explosion. And uh, so, as I say, he isn't related to me, but he, he certainly played a significant part in the, in the uh, disaster. Um, right, so uh, bodies recovered. Although the official death toll was 344, only 343 were recovered. And some of those who were recovered uh, couldn't be identified, and I presume they were the uh, miners who were nearest the explosion. They were, they, they were damaged by the uh, explosion. And surprisingly enough, the cause of death of most miners was carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. But of course, we all know, we've all seen cases in the paper where incomplete burning of methane, natural gas, generates toxic carbon monoxide, and presumably that's what, what happened here. Uh, cause of death by explosion, 9% is with those with the miners who were working nearest the explosion. 205 died in the yard mine, 95 in the plodding mine. So those are the two adjacent mines, so that all the deaths didn't occur where the explosion was. The last body recovered was on the 14th of February, 1911, seven or eight weeks later, which is quite surprising. <coughs> um, about 200 of the victims came from West Stoughton, the remainder from Double, Bolton, Avon and Tilsley. Um, 24 unidentified dead were buried in a vault in West Stoughton Cemetery. And uh, this is the memorial to those uh, victims and again as David has said this is where we laid a wreath uh, this morning. The actual inscription on the on the memorial is there but the the main facts are that there are 171 victims buried in West Orton ceremony uh, cemetery, 45 in Wingates, 20 in Daisy Hill, 3 in the Congregational Church Yard. Um, at the other end of uh, West Orton, at the Atherton boundary, <coughs> now, uh, the, 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 there's the, the, the other the approach to the Victoria from Atherton uh, 
is this um, is this inscription here, and uh, that's quite a, a famous uh, inscription. Um, <clears throat> the day after the explosion, the tram drivers were amazed that there was no one boarded the tram because all these regular passengers had been killed in the disaster. So that the tram ran from Bolton and Double and stopped. The terminus was at four lane ends. And the miners had to disembark the uh, tram and walk down uh, Newbrick Road and approach the mine walking through the fields, through uh, uh, the Broadwalk <coughs> um, area. The age distribution of the victims is shown here. The oldest victim was aged 61, but there were over 30 victims aged 13 to 15. Over 30. And the, 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 it was a young man's occupation, and you see the ages there were predominantly in the 20s and early 30s. The rescue. Well, of course, when the explosion occurred, it wasn't known how many people had been injured or killed. And the manager, Alfred Joseph Tong, uh, is quoted as saying, I'm not forcing anyone to go down. We may come back or we may not. I'll be the first. They had no idea what they were going to meet down, down the shaft. Mr. Tong and eight volunteers went down in the cage of number four shaft. But when they reached the mine, they couldn't explore very far to poor conditions of the air. There was destruction everywhere. They were not equipped with breathing equipment. It was possible to walk from uh, the, a, a given level from shaft number four to shaft number three, but the conditions didn't allow that. <clears throat> uh, and in particular, the lifts in number three shaft were so badly damaged and unused, so that we're relying just on the cage in number four shaft. This was a very, very brave initiative of going down uh, to look for, to try, attempt to rescue people, but because it wasn't known whether another explosion was likely to occur or whether there were any more roof falls or, or, or what dangers they would encounter. So that was a very, very brave act to, to do. Uh, but <clears throat> most of the rescue was in fact conducted by this Howbridge rescue team. This Howbridge rescue station was set up in 1908 and had trained men to use breathing apparatus and do rescue work in mine. But in addition to those several hundred uh, men, mainly miners from adjacent college, they would have felt the explosion underground. They turned up and attempted to assist with the rescue over the next few weeks. Um, as I've already said, the men from rescue from number four shaft were mostly alive, but the worst was suffering from gas exposure. So all the men down the pit weren't killed. It was just those that had gone down number three shaft. <clears throat> so this is the location of this Howbridge uh, Mines Rescue Station at the end of Lover's Lane, further down Lover's Lane than the Howbridge uh, uh, Cemetery. And that road at the bottom was the old road to from Atherton to, to Lee. And here we have some of the rescue men that were working, uh, have been trained at the Howbridge. Again, I'm a bit surprised they haven't got protective helmets on the head, but all the breathing apparatus was in the, these bags in, in front of them. Here we have uh, a makeshift mortuary with stretchers to uh, transport men. And this is uh, a, a slightly puzzling picture showing a, a horse and cart um, transporting coffins to, uh, for, 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 the, uh, for, the, for the victims. And that looks quite a surprisingly uh, ornate coffin. Maybe it was just one that was all, all ready for somebody else, I don't know. Um, so these men are helping to unload coffins. This is quite a, a famous picture 
uh, that relates to uh, the a victim, Enoch Arthur Bates, and his parents were members of the Salvation Army. This is his father, and that's his mother, and that's his sister. This gentleman here is the <coughs> father of Dolphus Columbia of the Sacred Heart Church, West Stockton, and he did a tremendous amount of work in assisting the recovery. These two ladies uh, had the unenviable job of uh, cleaning up bodies and helping people who, who <coughs> had been slightly injured. Um, I'll just mention the fact that they uh, didn't appear on the picture just as a, a fluke. They were, had, would have been working at the pit as pit brow women. They were employed in sorting the coal, removing stones and other uh, <coughs> debris from the coal and in some occasions, washing coal. So women actually worked up pits, but they didn't go down. I'm not sure who these other gentlemen are in the, in the picture. Uh, this is not an impressive picture, uh, but it, it, it shows the scale of the help that was needed to, uh, to identify bodies, to clean bodies up, and to help people who have been injured of life. So the West Orton District nurses, Nurse Gallimore, Jones and Green worked continuously, and Sarah Morgan, a pit bear worker, was on the scene for 50 hours attending to the welfare of the college and looking after the dead. On top of the coffins were placed any articles that could help to identify the <coughs> bodies. Uh, one of the belongings was a watch stopped at 10 to 8, and that's on display in West Harlem Library. Waiting for news. Again, this is a, a, a newspaper photograph showing the police attempting to keep members of the public back from away so that the rescuers can get on with the work. Uh, this train here is being used to transport uh, coffins from uh, the Pretoria pit up to Chakabend where they could be. Uh, taken away with the uh, horse and cart, etc., along the road. Again, we've got women in shawl waiting for, for news. This is the uh, picture of the uh, <coughs> unidentified bodies uh, and uh, in West Norton Cemetery, and there's uh, West St. Bart's uh, Church behind. Uh, this is another picture that relates to the Mothers, this is uh, a picture of Richard Mother and his son Daniel Mother being taken, the funeral procession taking them to St. Bartholomew's <coughs> church. This is where they, they were buried. In fact, I looked at the grave this morning. This is the bottom of Market Street and um, where we have Sunnybank and Southview. And this is before the uh, cenotaph has, has been constructed. Um, throughout the town, there are various memorials to the um, Pretoria event, and this is one that's in the, in the library. I won't go through all the names. This is another one. And um, this one at the f is one you all have seen because it's on the front of the, the corner of the town hall and Library Street, and it's dedicated to the, the memory of uh, cricketers who played in the Bolton Cricket League who were killed in, in, the, in the disaster. Now then, we come to some rather tragic uh, information. Tilsley family at Wingate, Miriam Tilsley lost her husband, four sons and two brothers. She died in 1913. And there's a memorial to Tilsley family in Wingate's churchyard where all the... Um, uh, it, it, it's the same with uh, West Salt Church. You know, all the Pretoria victims are all in the same areas. Horton family from Chequerbent, Mrs. Annie Horton lost her husband and three sons. Oldest victim was Thomas Greenall, age 61. I've already mentioned that, I think. But then we have information about the number of young lads that were killed, aged. 13, 14, and 15. And then equally disturbing is the fact that there were two lads who 
it was the first day of work down the pit. Killed the first day at work. Uh, another lady here uh, from Double. She lost her husband and three sons. Uh, other notable victims, seven members of Wingate's Temperance Band who played in the band or were committee members. They lost their lives, uh, but they had helped the band win these two famous championships in 1906 and 1907. Now then, uh, 160 rescuers were awarded the Bolton District Humane Society Medal. Seems quite a lot. They didn't necessarily all go down the pit. But those, the names of those men are in the book that Pam, that Pam Clark has, has written. And various medals were awarded. This one is this Bolton District Humane one. Uh, and this one here is the Royal Humane Society National Medal that was awarded. And there are special medals for uh, rescue work in mines and quarries and it's this Edwards medal here uh, and then there's this St John's medal. Now Alfred Tong I've mentioned before he uh, was particularly brave in the work he did and he was awarded the silver medal. 27 rescuers were awarded more than one medal. Alfred Joseph Tong was awarded four medals including two silver. Subsequently, he emigrated to Nova Scotia, uh, Canada, eastern coast of Canada, and was the manager of the new Waterford mine in 1917 when 65 mines were killed in the explosion. So he certainly had uh, his uh, share of disaster. Uh, um, this tea towel here has all the names of the victims. And again, that is an exhibit in the... In the uh, <coughs> display cabinets upstairs in the library. Uh, compensation. Uh, this enormous amount of money in, in, in that age, £145,000, was raised to uh, give to the uh, dependents and families of the victim. But each of the miners, they would, they would have some sort of insurance as well. And uh, the fund paid out to 154 widows, 320 children under the age of 14. Uh, but in addition, many of the men would be sindled so that their parents would receive some, uh, some, uh, some money from the, the fund. The last recipient of payment from the fund uh, was John Baxter, who died in January 1973, and the remaining funds were given to other miners relief funds. Uh, in the, there's another important source of information that I've not mentioned, the Lancashire Parishes website and on there if you go into West Orton and then Pretoria you can get the details of every victim and I'm just quoting this as, uh, as an example of the information available. So you've got the uh, name of the victim, the age, where he lived, where he was born, and uh, <coughs> where, where the body was discovered. Uh, <coughs> and his talent, he, he was easily identified because he had his talent number on, where some, some relative had to identify each of the body, can't just rely on, on that uh, talent there. And the, the cause of death and the rest of the details of, uh, of the dependents and relatives and uh, how much money was uh, was was awarded to these relatives? It's the same story with with the rest of them. So I won't bother going through that. Um, so th th these are the names of the funds that were, uh, were were set up to to provide compensation. <coughs> uh, now, subsequent improvements in mining. I said this was such a, a massive disaster. Something had to be done as a result of the. Uh, the Red Men uh, report. <coughs> the Coal Mines Act of 1911 introduced a number of major improvements to working practices. The success of the rescuers trained at Howbridge uh, was so impressive it led to requirements on colliery to ensure provision of rescue work on 
and rescue equipment in mind. <coughs> rescue stations had to be provided within a 10 mile radius of every mine. Specific laws on the design, use and maintenance of oil lamps were established <coughs> and additional regulations were the management of a colliery by one manager on the qualification about the competence of a colliery manager and under manager were introduced. Alfred Joseph Tong, I believe, was only aged 28 and I gathered that he would be have been in charge of several mines, so that's what that that statement about. However, all of these changes added expense to the running cost of a coal mine, which must make a profit to exist, otherwise safe mines could be unprofitable. Um, the uh, Pretoria mine started work several days after the explosion. It wasn't finished forevermore. People had to eat, people had to earn money to, to live so that the, the mines were not abandoned. Um, <clears throat> but nevertheless, mining remains as a relatively high hazardous, a dangerous occupation. Um, now, somebody at, at the end of this morning's uh, presentation said that they were under the impression that the the ventilation in the mines wasn't working at night uh, and that seems to be one of the causes to the build-up of gas. The, the, you would think that the vent ventilation would be working 24-7 but that's, that's what was said this morning. <coughs> um, the Pretoria actually closed in April 1934 and that would be either the seams had run out or flooding something of that nature and um, this is a picture showing the men at uh, one of the shafts i don't know which it, it would be um they there are very few uh, remains of the pretoria pit there's, the, there's this brickwork and there's a pick there's the capped this is the one of the shaft shafts that's that's capped <coughs> and uh, uh, in West Horton, there's a memorial at Ditchfield Gardens that was uh, erected in 2010 to commemorate the centenary. This is a minor, and the names of all the victims are behind. Again, as David has said, we, we laid a wreath uh, there this morning. <coughs> um, now, uh, in 2010, the Local History Group also commissioned this mural, which is again up in the library, this is pretty big, it's about 10 or 12 feet along and 5 or 6 feet high, and it shows the, uh, the disaster immediately after the, after the explosion, uh, coffins here, and uh, women uh, anxious for, for, for news. Um, uh, the, the, the central figure is a, a, a lad asking one of the rescuers, has seen my dad, so that there was still uncertainty about um, about the the extent of the of, of, of the deaths and the the, the victims. <coughs> uh, so, as I said, that mural is in West Horton Library, uh, and we have services every year at, uh, uh, at, at, at the. Uh, in the, in the churchyard at West Horn and at Ditchfield Gardens. Now, um, I'll, I said I'd give you Alan Davis's information again. Um, there's his contact detail if anyone's interested. Pitheadbass at AOL.com. Um, <clears throat> and I think that is uh, all I've got to say. Uh, by all means, ask any questions.